It's midnight, zero degrees, the temperature's dropping. New York, January 1981, I'm 21 years old, and I'm flying home to San Francisco after a New York visit with the neurotic family. And I can't wait to get home. Unfortunately, our plane has been delayed for three hours already. I'm at the Capitol Air uh, gate, and there's a, a blackboard where they have been writing the time of departure, and they have to keep erasing it. 9, 10, 11, midnight, 1 in the morning, and the temperature keeps dropping, and, you know, they have to keep de-icing the plane, and, but... I'm excited to go home, and finally around 1.30, we're on the plane. We're sitting on the plane. I ha I'm by the window. Next to me is Laura, the law student, and next to her is Eric, who's this good-looking journalist from San Francisco, and uh, excited to go. Oddly, we can't have any drinks while we're waiting there. I mean coffee or tea because we are informed that the pipes are frozen. Oh well. So I'm in my down vest and my hiking boots and I feel prepared as always and sturdy. So then there's this whoosh, and this really cold blast of air comes into the plane by our feet. And that's very peculiar. And we all look at each other and the pilot gets on and the intercom and he says, well, folks, uh, sorry, it's going to be a little bit longer because, uh, you know, the guys out there working on de-icing the plane, they, they're, they're having some frostbite problems, so uh, they had to come in and get warmed up before they go out and de-ice again. And we exchange glances and think, okay, well, that's what happens. So... We're getting to know each other and looking forward to getting home. And, uh, and then suddenly there's bang, 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 bang at the window. We're si still sitting at the gate, but there's the little glass window there, and there's some parents who are pounding the glass on the door, and they're saying, we want our daughter off this plane, because she was an unaccompanied minor. And... Uh, she gets off the plane, and now it's really starting to feel like a disaster movie. And, uh, you know, she's off the plane, but, you know, it's after two now, and we, <laughs> we're going to go. We feel sure of it. Three o'clock in the morning, time to leave. There's no airline traffic there on the runway, so we're first <laughs> down the runway. And uh, we head off, and the plane, as it lifts, makes this noise that goes, and it sounds like this beast trying to lift itself. And I've been on a lot of planes, and I've never heard anything <laughs> like that in my life. And I'm thinking, well, I know the statistic that most accidents happen either on takeoff or on landing, and so this is going to be a takeoff crash. <laughs> but miraculously, we don't crash. We rise up into the sky, and then the pilot gets on as if everything's totally normal, and he says, Okay, we'll be flying at an altitude of 38,000 feet tonight, and our route will take us past Iowa City, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're all ready for a nice, quiet flight now to go across the country to San Francisco. They turn the lights off. People are reading or sleeping. I, I'm sort of too keyed up. I can't sleep, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm resting there. Laura's asleep next to me. Eric is reading a book. And everything calms down. The plane is 
diving. It is diving straight down, and I know the sound of it is a plane diving straight <laughs> down, and people are screaming, and people are throwing up, and objects are flying, and the oxygen masks come out of the ceiling, and, you know, it was the middle of the flight. Everybody was all calm. We, we have to be in the middle of the country. We're not landing, in other words. So I think, I guess, this is it now. And this voice says back to me, nah, it's not. <laughs> and I don't know, I listened to that voice. And so... <laughs> Laura next to me is like turning colors, and so I think, well, I'll, I'll tend to her, and you know, get out the vomit bag, and you know, rubbing her shoulders, and she's completely freaking out, and I'm, you know, tending to her on one side, and Eric is tending to her on the other side. And after what seems like an endless amount of time of falling, diving, not just falling, diving, the plane levels out. And then the pilot gets on the intercom and he says, uh, sorry about that, folks. Uh, <laughs> we were having a pressurization problem up there and we need to get to a lower altitude. So uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do next, but I'll let you know as soon as I know. <laughs> so the aftermath is... For me, this exhilaration of being alive and, and it's dawn, the sun's starting to come up in the west and it's beautiful. And then he gets back on and says, we're going to give everybody a free drink. And so, well, sure, why not, you know? And the stewardess comes along with the tray, and then Eric says, you know, well, I'm going to have a double bourbon, and, you know, I want to be cool like Eric. I said, yeah, I want a double bourbon, too. And uh, so there we are, uh, and there's lots of people who have suffered from the fall. They've got, I mean, they have real physical problems from that fall, and, you know, not everybody had their seatbelts on, right, in the middle of the flight. So... Um, the uh, um, pilot gets back on, and then he says, you know, folks, uh, we don't think this plane's going to make it over the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> so uh, we're going to uh, land at uh, Denver Stapleton Airport, which is, will be in about 20 minutes, and uh, we'll, we'll get you to San Francisco from there. And so... <sighs> Okay, we'll land in Denver then. And uh, the stewardess has now parked the drink cart at the end of the aisle and left it there. And so one young man appoints himself bartender, and you know, we're all getting our, you know, little bottles and beers, and he's just distributing. And amazingly, we land in Denver uneventfully. So we're on the ground, and at that time, right over the restaurant, it said, good morning, Bloody Mary or screwdriver? And I'm like, well, Bloody Mary, you know, sure. <laughs> so we eat, and then we're sitting in a, a lobby waiting uh, to find out really what's going to happen to us. And uh, a whole group of people say, I am never getting on a plane ever again in my life. And about, I don't know, 20 of them go off to go rent a car and they're going to drive back to San Francisco. <laughs> and then another group, I don't know, roughly the same size, there were, I think, 300 people on the plane. Uh, another group says, there's an Amtrak station in Denver, so we're going to take the train back. And uh, there's a, a lawyer there who had been on the flight, and she says, we're, I, we're gonna take legal action against this <laughs> plane company, Capital Air, for, for what's happened. And if anybody is interested in being in a class action lawsuit, put your name and contact info. And the yellow pad passes around, and I sign it, you know, not really thinking much about it. And um, 
we're waiting. They tell us eventually that uh, they've gotten us, the rest of us who are still there, uh, on, a, on a united wide body jet to San Francisco. And I'm like, all right. So I figured, made it this far, you know. So we're going to fly home. And so how far did we fall? We found out the next day there were headlines about this flight all over the country. And we descended 20,000 feet in two minutes, which is approximately a mile every 30 seconds. So, we fly back to San Francisco uneventfully. It's the most beautiful day in the universe, and, and I'm really happy to be alive and holding hands with Eric as we're walking out of the plane. But, well, my boyfriend's waiting for me. I don't do that anymore. So, um, we, we're off the plane then, and I'm a little bit sorry even that this adventure is kind of ending because it's been so thrilling and exciting, and I feel so alive. <laughs> and, um, and it's kind of like we're all this family, you know, everyone who was on that plane. And, and then it turns out that everybody who was waiting for us was, became this other family, because we're arriving at noon, a mere 12 hours late, and this is before cell phones. Nobody knows what's happened to us. And all those people, including my boyfriend, were freaking out and worried because they didn't get any info from Capital. And they all went to somebody's house and slept over at, the, at her house, you know? So they had a good time, too. And uh, so that was January 1981. Two years later, the class action suit went through. Capital Air and Boeing were sued. Capital Air uh, went bankrupt. I got, I don't know, I think it was $1,200, which was a lot of money, and I went to Europe for the first time, <laughs> flying all kinds of cheap airlines. <laughs> and it was a wonderful adventure. In 1985, December, a plane, another DC-8, leased by the US military to transport troops, was flying home 250 military members from Beirut. And the plane crashed over Gander, Newfoundland, killing all 250 members plus eight crew. The next day, we would find out in newspapers that that plane had had two other incidents earlier that very year, and it was the same DC-8 that Capital Air had owned that I flew from New York to San Francisco. Thank you. <laughs>